There are some other variations, but these are the main ones. Each state law is a little different. Good day, my name is David Fusco. And in this show, I'm gonna talk about business, finance, and how to survive and thrive in this crazy environment that we're living in today. Welcome to my show. Good day, everyone. My name is David Fusco, and this is my first video for the current year. So a happy new year to everybody. And uh, in my opinion, this year is tuning up to be probably one of the more interesting ones that we're gonna have in life. But today's topic, uh, I'm gonna kinda like build off of uh, the last uh, video I did, which was on um, elder planning and what happens with the states. And from that video, I had a few questions and comments saying, you know, how, how do we understand ownership of assets? How are things treated? And so that's what we're gonna talk about today is, is how you own ownership of assets, what that means, what the different types of ownership mean, what your liabilities are, how control operates, and what happens in the case of the eventuality of an estate, someone passing on and what happens to those assets held in the different forms. The, the right answer and the best answer is whatever fits your circumstances and whatever's best. And another thing to keep in mind is, is in the United States, we have 50 states, plus we have uh, protectorates and uh, the such, like in Washington, D.C. These are all separate legal entities that have their own laws and may have slightly different definitions of how you can own things and what the ownership means in those states. So you need to look into your particularities. But I'm going to just be going over the general concept of how things are owned. Well, the most common way things are owned, and most people own them, is as, as an individual. Mr. Mr. You all there, I think. I don't know. Well, whatever. It's okay. We got the point. Uh, when you own things as an individual, obviously, it's the simplest form. And that's how most people um, first start acquiring assets. So you can open up a bank account as an individual. You can open up, uh, a, you can buy stock as an individual. You can open up brokerage accounts as an individual. You can buy property, uh, cars, etc. as an individual. Obviously the most, the best part about it is, is well, you have total 100% control of that asset. So from that point of view, it's the simplest way to own something. On the other side of the coin, there are some negatives. All the liability, 100% of the liability of the ownership of those assets resides with that individual. So that could be a problem depending on what asset you're owning. So if it's something that may generate great liability, it may not be the best way to own something. From an income tax point of view, well, it's pretty straightforward. We all file tax returns uh, individually. So uh, anything you own individually would just flow through to that. Your interest earned from the banks, your stock uh, account activity. Uh, if you have rental property owned individually in the same fashion, all flows through your personal return. So from a control point, it's the most easiest. And obviously, since unless you have schizophrenia and have disagreements within yourself, you're in good shape. So your best control. Liability is not the best. Uh, anything that happens that a liability could come your way, it's going to. So if you're driving your car and you're on title to that car, you have an accident, you are personally responsible, and the title of the car since it's in your name brings that liability right to you, and potentially everything you own, if your insurance doesn't cover, is going to be at risk. Um, from a tax point of view, it's simple as pie, like anything else. Everything that's owned individually just flows right through onto your personal return if it has an income tax impact. So it's kind of a neutral thing. Uh, or, or it's easy. And then estate. What happens when somebody passes away is that the assets they own immediately go into the estate of the name of that person. So up to the date of death, that person is an individual, they pass away, it's now the estate of whoever, so-and-so. 
um, as an individual when you own assets. The assets go into the estate, depending on what they are. There's different tax ramifications. But effectively, what happens is if you own real estate or stocks, uh, bonds, they get marked to the market value at the date of death. And your beneficiaries would inherit those assets from the estate at the current market value. A nice advantage of that is if, let's say, you, you know, mom and dad bought a house back in the 1970s and they bought it for $35,000. That same house now is worth $350,000. So if mom and dad had sold that house, they would have had a significant capital gain. 350 minus 35, they would have had a $315,000 gain. They pass away and you inherit it. It gets brought to the market value since it was owned by them as individuals. And now if you sold that house for $350,000, your basis is $350,000, no taxation, not bad. So the simplest form again of owning something is as an individual. But a lot of times things don't work out that way and you might have something that you're going to try to do. You want to do something with a family member, um, whatever, or a buddy, if, or whatever. So that is something that is owned jointly. And again, it's in individual names, usually. It doesn't have to be. But let's just keep it that way, names. So you may have a house, and it's owned by Bob and Sue. And if Bob and Sue are married, well, what happens is, is that house is owned as what's called in some states, and not every state has this law, tenants in the entirety. Only married couples can be tenants in the entirety. And of course, the state law has to have that availability. It's a strange way of owning something. And what effectively it means is that each, both Bob and Sue own 100% of the house simultaneously. So from a liability point of view, it does give you protection because if, let's say, Sue uh, had a lawsuit against her and they go to come after the house, well, she owns 100%, so does Bob. Strange, but it's how it works. So effectively, it becomes very difficult for a creditor to get access to those types of assets. Uh, what happens when, um, you know, from a control point of view, where you get a husband and a wife, and we all know the wife has control usually. Uh, but in fact, but in under law, it, it's joint. So it, it takes the decision of both. Um, interesting thing is, is that either of these owners can legally bind the other, bind the other owner to agreements that they've made with third parties. So let's say Sue went out and hired a contractor uh, for $10,000 and signed it. Bob is going to be held responsible for that also. So in a partnership, or sorry, in a uh, tenants in the entirety or in any jointly held property, the joint owners can bind the other owners to the liability. So that's a thing to consider. Uh, from an income tax point of view, well, if it's a husband or a wife, it doesn't really matter. Pretty much, mostly, unless they do a separate return, it's going to flow through to the individual return. So from that point of view, it's not 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 much different. Another way to own assets as jointly is what's called tenants in common. In a tenants in common ownership, Bob and Sue are not married, but now they're they're just two friends. And they decide they're going to buy a house together and they're going to own it as tenants in common. What that means is that is that they each have a, unless it's stated elsewise, and it would have to be stated, the assumption would be 50-50, unless it's stated in the deed or in some other document that says, okay, Bob has 60, Sue has 40. Uh, but in general, without anything stated, tenants in common, each own a proportionate share. If there were three owners, it would be one third each. If it was four owners, it would be 25% each. Um, and again, in tenants in common, you're individually named owning it, that, that house or whatever it is, any liability flows through to each person equally and severally. So a creditor against the, the people who own this house jointly as tenants in common, if there's a, a, a lawsuit or a problem of some sort, the, they can go after Bob for the entire amount or they can go after Sue for the entire amount. They're not responsible to separate it into 50% or 
thirty percent or whatever that is interest. Um, they just go after whoever they want. They don't even have to go after everyone. Well, there's more stuff about that, but and we're not getting into that. So this is just a basic form of ownership. Um, and of course, a lot of people are familiar with tenants um, with right of survivorship. In a in a case of tenants in the okay, we don't want to spread all the letters out. A tenants in the right of survivorship means oh, let me go back to the tenants to come before I talk about that. Let's say Bob died. Sue, as a tenant in common, doesn't get the other half of the house. Bob's will is going to govern what owns, who gets that. So his estate or his will, if he didn't have a, you know, if he, if he will, if he had one, uh, the law of the state takes over and says in a tenant common situation, it's owned 50% by Bob in this case, 50% by Sue. Bob's uh, will uh, or state law will then govern what happens to Bob's share of that house. Tenants with right of survivorship, same thing. We got Bob and Sue unmarried. What happens is, is that if Bob passed away, we, since she, Sue had right of survivorship, the property transfers immediately over to Sue. There's no even need to uh, go to the courts. It's an automatic operation by law. In the other situations with, uh, well, tenants in common entirely would be the same thing as, as uh, the right of survivorship. But in a tenants in common situation, you're most likely going to have to go through state probate in order to get that other 50% interest in the property transferred to the beneficiaries of Bob in case of Bob passing. Um, there's a lot more to it. There are some other variations, but these are the main ones. Each state law is a little different. So that's as far as, you know, how you title the assets. And again, like I said, there's more, but we want to keep this short so that we're not going into hours and hours, which I'm sure everyone would just love to listen to me talk for hours about something. Um, what are the more methods of... Uh, What other methods of uh, ownership are there? Well, when you own an asset, let's say to buy a building, to create a business um, or anything like that, you know, you can own an asset in a partnership. There are different types of partnerships. There's a general partnership. There's a limited partnership. Those are really the main ones that, that, that we're going to deal with. Um, so a partnership is made up of, can, must always have at least one general partner. General partner means that they're the ones responsible for everything that goes on within the assets owned by the partnership. If it's rental property, if it's a business, whatever. So if there's a problem and you have two or three, oh, obviously, sorry, one thing that needed to be mentioned. In order to have a partnership, you need two or more owners. It, you, 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 ha you can't be a partnership with just one person. But again, if you're schizophrenic, you've got to look into that, got to ask some attorneys if that's the case. But in general, two, two or more owners. At least one of the owners has to be a general partner. But if both owners are general partners, then each partner is personally liable for everything that goes on in that partnership, every document signed by that partnership, every loan taken out, everything done. If you have a limited partnership within the scope of that partnership, so you'd have general partners, and you could also have limited partners. A limited partner is exactly what it sounds like. They're limited to the liability of their investment. So if they put uh, $100,000 into a, a partnership as a limited partner, the most they can lose is $100,000. As a general partner, unlimited loss. So there's a big difference there. Uh, what happens in the case of uh, control? Well, if you have just one general partner, he's in control. If you have multiple general partners, you now have discussions to make and there could be issues. I had a client uh, who um, had a general partnership. There was, uh, I think, 10 of them. There was a 2% owner and the 2% owner stopped a real estate transaction that 98% of the partners wanted. So in a partnership setup, if you all general partners, you best have a solid agreement that specifies who makes the decisions 
and, and, and how. Um, from an income tax point of view, partnerships are not tax paying entities in general. How, so any profits and or losses from the partnership will flow through to the individual owners, whether they are people or corporations. And in the case of an estate, what happens is, is that the partnership is valued. And then if you own a 25% interest in that partnership, um, the value of that partnership is to you, to your beneficiaries, I should say, is increased by that 25%. So it's a little quick thought on a partnership. The next form is a corporation. A corporation is a separate legal entity. A uh, corporation has, in general, a perpetual life, meaning that um, if the owners die, the corporation keeps going. So I'm going to jump back to that partnership. In a, in a partnership, if a general partner dies, effectively the partnership is dissolved and a new partnership is created if there, as long as there is more than two people. In a corporation, it's perpetual. It just keeps going on. There are two main types of corporations in the United States, and there are more than that, but let's just stick with the main types. We have a C-Corp and an S-Corp. A C-Corporation, both corporations are separate legal entities. Both types of corporations have a separate tax return to file. But the main difference is a C-Corp pays tax on its own return. An S-Corp, the profits or losses go to the owners. There are very strict rules with S corporations. Uh, it can't be owned. It can only be owned by uh, individuals that are residents of the United States or U.S. citizens. C corporations don't have that issue. Uh, as far as a liability, if the corporation is set up properly, if there's a problem and a liability that affects the corporation, let's say it's a rental property. Uh, and somebody falls and gets hurt and, and the injury goes way beyond the coverage of uh, the insurance. The worst that happens is you lose the asset, but it doesn't pierce the corporate shield, shield as long as you set things up properly and your personal assets are left standing. In the case of an, uh, an estate, when somebody passes on, what happens is, is that Let's say that the corporation only owned one asset and it's a building and the building's worth, the, you know, was what, like that first case, $35,000, but now it's worth three fifty. dollars And let's say the person that owned that stock died. What happens is, is the stock gets revalued to $350,000. Now notice what I said, the stock gets revalued, not the asset. So when the, asset, the corporation sells the asset, there's going to be a gain of $315,000. Sold for three fifty, bought for three fifteen. I uh, sorry, bought for um, thirty five thousand, uh, three hundred and fifteen thousand dollar gain. The corporation pays the tax. You go, but well, wait, I should get the uptick. No, you didn't get an uptick in the basis of the building. You got an uptick in the basis of the stock. The only way to get the value out of that stock is you would have to dissolve the corporation in the same year in order to get the proper offset. So you'd have the gain from the Three fifty, three hundred fifteen thousand dollars gain, and then you'd have the basis right off from dissolving the corporation. Uh, there's all the tax planning that can be done. Corporations are, in my opinion, not the best way to own real estate because you lose a lot of different benefits, um, or especially depending on the state that you're in. So that's the the corporation. There are other forms of uh, owner owning things. Corporations can also be not for profits. Uh, you can have oh ah, another big one. Sorry, but it's not what you think. People think I want to create an LLC or what's called a limited liability company. And a limited liability company doesn't really. It, it is a separate legal form of owning things. However, it can take on the form of a sole proprietor, meaning an individual. It could take on the form of a partnership. It could take on the form of a S corp. It could take on the form of a C corp. Why those different things? We don't ask why. We just know it's the law. And again, each state is different. Um, however, limited liability companies do shield you from some liabilities. So let's say you had an operating business and you're set up as a sole proprietor and um, there's a problem happens in your your 
building, somebody trips and falls and gets injured, there's a lawsuit. As an individual sole proprietor, it would go against the business and it would go against the potentially against the assets of the individual owner. If that person was an LLC, it would go against the business and it would stop at that. So as, as a, a single owner LLC, there is value in it from a liability point of view. It could be set up as a partnership, it could, an LLC. An LLC can be taxed as a corporation. It can be taxed as an S corporation. These are all elections and considerations that you need to take into effect when you're deciding how to create something or own something. So just to recap, the, the way of owning stuff is individually, jointly, with all its variations. Uh, you can create things and own things as a sole proprietor, which is the same thing as an individual. You can own things as a partnership, And in a partnership, it's kind of akin to owning things jointly. It's akin, not the same. You could be a corporation, which is truly a separate legal entity and a separate tax filing entity. And, or, and you can utilize an LLC or a limited liability company to be any of these types. And then here you have C Corp and you have S Corp. So if you're a client, you're welcome and you're going to do something or set something up and you want to do some planning, uh, whether you want to incorporate uh, financial planning or tax planning, how you own assets is very important, something to review with me um, or talk to your individual advisors uh, to find out if you're set up the best way that you can be. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Everybody.